today, I had an amazing conversation with Dr. Edith Strand. She is an amazing SLP in person. She's super kind. I was nervous before an interview because she's just contributed so much to the field. Um, and this is such an amazing episode that we've actually sh- condensed it into a part one and a part two, because we know like we like to keep the episodes to be clear and concise so you can listen on your drive into work. Um, but if you haven't heard of Dr. Edith Strand, we talk today all about the characteristics of praxia. We talk about dynamic assessment, um, what that that means, what our approach should be when we have a student who has apraxia. Um, we also talk about DTTC and such amazing information uh, from the dynamic assessment to the intervention and how we should really be treating our students who have apraxia of speech. Such great information, step-by-step things that we can look for, why it's so important to have specific treatment for students who have these characteristics, how we can differentially diagnose, and then we also get into treatment. Um, Dr. Edith Strand is a uh, was a professor um, at Mayo College. Um, she was the former head of the Division of Speech Pathology, um, Department of Neurology at the Mayo Clinic um, in Minnesota. And her research has focused on developmental acquired and progressive of apraxia of speech and issues related to intelligibility and comprehensibility and degenerative dysarthria. Um, She has a long history too, which is really, really cool. And she wanted to make sure that my listeners really understood that. While she does have a lot of research, this amazing body of research, she was and is a practicing clinician. And so she spent a lot of her days working with clients, which is so, so cool. So we talk, she has specific examples that she shares. Um, She talks about the Mayo Clinic and the intensive treatment that was received there. Uh, And it's just such a wealth of information. We really dive on in to apraxia. And I just can't wait for you to listen to all this information. It was super exciting for me to chat with her. And this is part one of two parts with Dr. Eva Strand. You're listening to Autism Outreach Podcast, a podcast full of ready-to-use strategies to help those with autism strengthen their communication skills. Here's your host, Rose Griffin of ABA Speech, a speech therapist and board-certified behavior analyst who shares tips you can use in your next therapy session. All right. Thanks so much for joining us on episode 44 of the Autism Outreach Podcast. And we have a stellar episode for you today. I am beyond excited. We have with us Dr. Edith Strand. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to our conversation. It's amazing to have you on. This has been so cool to talk with you. We did a little uh, bit of a meeting last week uh, because we hadn't met exactly yet virtually. And I found out about you and your work really um, when you were offering this, I think it was a 10 hour, maybe free course. Um, We had talked about it a little bit um, and it was just really just amazing information. My company is an ASHA approved CE provider. So I really appreciate people that put together really great courses like you had offered. And um, it was just so informative. And I was like, wow, this is great information. Um, So I think that's when you first popped into my radar. But, you know, I get a lot of questions from parents and there's just so much information out there about apraxia. Um, And just, I'm so excited to talk with you about that tonight and just share that information because what we had kind of talked about before is, you know, I've been a practicing clinician 20 years and I never had a whole course on apraxia or probably anything that you're going to talk about. So I'm a little selfish in the fact that I'm definitely a lifelong learner. And um, I like to have a podcast because I like to have people on uh, that I like to learn from. And I know my listeners are going to be so excited. Um, But you've just had such an amazing career and have contributed so much to the field. Um, But can you tell people, if they're not familiar with your work, can you tell us um, about you and your journey in the field? Sure. I'll try to make it as brief as I can. I'm, I'm getting up there now, so it's kind of been a long time. Uh, I got my master's degree in 73, so I'm almost to 50 years. <laughs> so um, I actually practiced in the public schools and private practice for nine years before I went back and did my doctorate and then was in uh, at the University of Vermont and the University of Washington uh, as a professor, but continued to always be in the clinic, seeing kids, doing clinical research, seeing I did a lot of 
work in my early career actually with adult motor speech disorders, and then again at Mayo. So while I was at the University of Washington, I was recruited luckily, amazingly, uh, to the Mayo Clinic, where medical speech pathology actually began. And I was working there uh, with my colleague, Joe Duffy, and later with uh, Heather Clark. And it was just a a wonderful opportunity. Um, We saw patients all day, every day. So I'd like your listeners to know I'm their colleague. I'm a peer. I'm a clinician first. Um, We did come in often on the weekends and evenings to do uh, research and writing. But it was a wonderful clinical laboratory at Mayo because we saw so many children and adults with motor speech disorders due to neurologic problems. So I've been so fortunate to be a clinician, a researcher, a professor. And now in retirement, I'm doing a lot of teaching and consulting. And it's a way to keep contributing, uh, which feels really important to me. Um, I only retired because my daughter uh, had a child and I was finally a Nana. And so I moved back to Seattle to be with my grandchildren, but I have the opportunity to travel all over the United States. And in fact, you know, much, much of Europe and Scandinavia and um, other places that it's just been an amazing opportunity to meet speech pathologists, clinicians all over. And all of them talking like you did about the fact they had very little training in pediatric motor speech disorders in their university settings. So I feel like, you know, this fills a void. And so uh, that's what I'm doing now. Wow. I'm hashtag life goals. Those are some of my life goals there. I'm doing them on a small scale. I am um, a speech therapist in a school three days a week. And then I have my own business, ABA Speech. We're an ASHA approved CE provider. And, you know, we do courses and, you know, but I do some consultations and coaching. And I do a lot of things abroad too um, with my BCBA licensure. Um, it's a little bit easier, but it's really amazing. And I, I just, I did an international consult this week with a family. And I, I love being able to help people who just don't have the resources, you know, in their geographic area. Like I love being able to just virtually connect with people. And it does feel so good to be able to help in that very specific way. When you specialize in something, it's, it's so, it's so cool. I love that you're doing all those things. I love all those things too. So I I knew we were going to... Yes, it's awesome. Um, So today, I know we're going to talk about uh, quite a few things, and we're going to start really basic. Um, So if you're listening, we have we do have some listeners that are parents, and then we also have speech therapists, and then we also have some people um, who are just special education professionals. So I think this information will be really, uh, really great. So just kind of starting out with the basics here, um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about the characteristics of apraxia? I I will. I'll be happy to. Uh, First of all, I think it's important to remember that apraxia is just a label for a speech sound disorder. When I often am teaching or asked to to speak somewhere or consult, there's this misconception that it's a medical diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And it's really not any more than adult apraxia is. The stroke or whatever caused it is the medical diagnosis and apraxia is a type of speech disorder. So childhood apraxia of speech is a type of disorder. It does have particular characteristics that help us with that differential diagnosis. The trouble is there's many, many lists of these characteristics, and they're all present in children with apraxia of speech. The trouble is some of them um, are clearly present, but not necessarily discriminative. Mm -hmm. Um, because those characteristics are common in all types of speech sound disorders. So, you know, those would be things like uh, a limited consonant and vowel repertoire, the use of simple syllable shapes or um, frequent omission of sounds, those kinds of things. Uh, Poor intelligibility, that can be due to the the result of any speech sound disorder if Mm -hmm. it's severe. The the characteristics, though, that are more likely to be discriminative relate to the movement characteristics that occur 
because of the difficulty with planning and programming movement gestures. So in these kids, you'll see awkward movement. Um, we have to, instead of, it's really, it's kind of a paradigmatic shift because as trained speech pathologists, we're so used to thinking at the phoneme level, right? If right. we're thinking about articulation. Mm -hmm. And in a praxis of speech, in both assessment and treatment, we're looking at the movement. Movements are sequential. We don't say at we go right. at. And so, you know, when I'm teaching, I'm always taking my voice out and say, you have to watch the movement, you know, boy, look at the movement, because that's what you're, you're training. But it's also true in assessment. So you look for a characteristic where there's that awkward movement through the movement transition. You'll see groping and trial and error behavior. Sometimes the groping is silent. Sometimes it's uh, accompanied with voice. You often don't see that, however, in their spontaneous utterances, but you will see it when you're eliciting speech, like in a, uh, a motor speech exam. Oh, If they're yeah. trying something, they don't, because when they're just talking, especially if they're more severe, they're going to say what they can say. Right. But if they're trying a movement pattern that they don't yet have, then you'll see that that groping. Um, vowel distortions are really common in children with apraxia of speech. Um, inconsistent voicing errors and inconsistent manner errors. So if you expect a voice sound and you think, was that voiced or unvoiced? That's a sign of apraxia because of the mistiming of the categorical perception typically, um, or a blending of manner where you hear a sound that isn't really an M, but it isn't really a B either. Mm. So those are distorted sounds right. that um, are more characteristic of apraxia of speech. They're not just substitutions. Another thing we see a lot in apraxia is an intrusive schwa. So instead of saying bed, they might say beda, yeah. where they put that little uh at the end. Mm -hmm. And that you rarely see in phonologic impairment, mm -hmm. but it's typical in uh, childhood apraxia of speech. It can also be in the middle of a word, like instead of bike, they might go bayak, mm. bayak. So that's mm -hmm. an intrusive schwa. And then one thing, and I want to finish with this because it, it's, it's sometimes misunderstood. Inconsistency across repeated productions of a word is a big hallmark and everyone talks about it. And at Mayo, we would get so many kids with inconsistent errors. And so just for that reason, they were considered a practic. And that doesn't always work that way because kids with some kinds of speech sound disorders can be very inconsistent. Also, children with phonologic impairment, as they get into therapy and they're starting to generalize, they're inconsistent, they're self-correcting, mm -hmm. that's common, but it's not a sign of apraxia in that child. Um, also, kids with apraxia who are very severe are going to be consistent because they can't do very much. Right. So we look at inconsistency really in the context of repeated word production, like in a... Um, in a motor speech exam. Okay. And if you ask them to say, tell me boy, and then they distort the vowel and say it again. And this time they distort the consonant and the vowel. And the next time they might be closer, you know, that mm -hmm. is the kind of inconsistency we see in apraxia. So, you know, there, there's lots of lists out there, but you have to think mm -hmm. about the context that you're, you're, paying attention to the <laughs> right. characteristics about. And you have to think about, is this discriminative or is this something I might hear in a number of, of speech sound disorders? I think the other thing we really emphasize is that you also want to look for these characteristics across tasks. Mm -hmm. Never do it just, never say, well, I, I talked with the child and heard these characteristics. That's conversation is one task. You might want to do picture description, conversation, story mm -hmm. retail, and certainly a motor speech exam. Right.
Oh, that's good to know. And you know, an observation, I mean, would you agree like observation too, if you can see the child, I'm just thinking as a school-based therapist, I always try to observe just to see, cause it's so different in the different environments, right? Like Absolutely. me in the therapy room with a student versus them talking to their friends at lunch, like lunch gym, that's like a lot of good information for me because kids yes. seem to, it's unstructured, right? Okay. Yes, that's, right. that's really good information. I guess what I really struggle with too, like I, the information, information you're sharing is so amazing and so specific. And I, I, I think too, to people that, um, you know, probably haven't maybe heard this information or haven't taken a course in this. So I think there are probably a lot of speech therapists that are probably like really nervous, like, oh my goodness, what if I've been treating a student wrong? You know, what if I haven't been using the right, um, treatment, you know, what happens if we don't use specific treatments towards apraxia for a student, like let's say that we just aren't, we haven't taken a course on this and we're just not as in tune with this, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, kind of what are the pitfalls, I guess, if we're not treating Mm -hmm. it correctly, you know? I can speak to that, but first, let me just assure any SLP out there who's feeling that way. We have all experienced that with patients and both adults and children. I certainly have. When I started in my hospital work, uh, to be honest, I had no idea what I was doing. I had to do a lot of continuing ed. I hadn't had a good neural background at that point in time. I think that's the whole reason I did the doctor. <laughs> right. But, <laughs> but uh, because I was so chagrined and there were times where I would drive home in tears because I felt like I wasn't helping that, helping that stroke patient who had that severe apraxia. It will happen in our career. What we do is hard. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I want to say is don't beat yourself up. (laughs) What you're doing, though, is listening to a podcast about Mm -hmm. this topic. You're putting yourself out there to learn more. And that's terrific. And there are lots of ways to get more information about apraxia that I will share. I forgot to ask you about this, Rose, but I'm going to send you. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you have a place to post all these. Show um, notes, yeah, absolutely. Both, both video kind of courses that are free, mm-hmm. as well as uh, articles that will meet different needs. But oh, great. Um, it was so. But let's say you don't know what you're doing, and this happened a lot at Mayo, where we would get kids with severe apraxia who had been in therapy for a few years and still had no words. This mm-hmm. does happen. Mm-hmm. Well, it, several things can happen, and it all depends on the severity. If they're real severe and you're doing a language-based, child-centered or child-driven you know, driven approach, right. very little change in motor speech will likely occur. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, if you're taking an articulation approach, they might, and they're not real, real severe, they will make progress. It's just going to take a lot longer if you don't implement principles of motor learning. That's right. that's probably all that'll happen. Um, On the other hand, if the child's quite severe, they could make very little progress or no progress. But at that point, I think any therapist is going to, you know, ask for a second opinion, reach out to their village, to their, to their Mm -hmm. people (laughs) and get get some answers. It, It does make a difference. We, Mm -hmm. we saw that over and over again at Mayo where kids came in with, with very little speech. And once we switched to a motor approach, increased the frequency of therapy, Mm -hmm. um, increased the, uh, number of practice trials per session Mm -hmm. and implemented a number of principles of motor learning, which I'm going to give you references for that you can access easily. I mean, there's big articles that I could give you, but right. I mean, there's some that are, we've written that that are just clinical based. This is what mm-hmm. you can do tomorrow, that kind mm-hmm. of thing, which oh, I yeah. think is so important. So, you know, it depends on the severity of the child, but it does, it does make a difference if you, yeah. if you aren't taking this motor approach. Yeah, no, that's really good to know. And I know I had on a speech therapist recently who also has a daughter daughter who has apraxia and she just really immersed herself in apraxia. Those are the only clients that she sees now. I think her daughter's in middle school now because she really didn't have a background in it and she couldn't believe that she hadn't learned all this. And so she she really dug deep and uh, that's what she specializes um, in now. So it's, it's cool um, because she just felt like, how did I not know this? And so she really kind of dug in. Um, so I know that we always have to start with an assessment. That's obviously most important. We've talked about that a little bit, um, but can you talk to us like, what is a dynamic? dynamic assessment? What does that consist of? Right. Well, (laughs) dynamic assessment is different than a lot of the assessments we do in speech pathology in that it involves actual cueing 
and then scoring responses based on the response to that cueing versus static assessment. Let's say an example of an Arctic test, maybe a Goldman Fristo or, or a language test, maybe you're doing an OWLS or whatever you're doing. Typically, there's a, a picture or a question and they respond once and we note the response. So that's static assessment. And that's a lot of what we do. Mm -hmm. Dynamic assessment was being done uh, quite a bit in language disorders and a little bit in phonology. And I started thinking about that. And I was thinking about what I do in assessment just naturally. And I realized this is dynamic assessment. Why don't we have a tool for that? And um, so over a number of years, I'm embarrassed to say like 10 years, um, I developed this dynamic uh, assessment called uh, uh, DEMS, Dynamic Evaluation of Motor Speech Skill. But it's just one, I mean, a, a person doesn't have to like get the DEMS because right. it just means you're doing a motor speech exam. So for a very severe child, you'd have uh, some con- number of consonant vowel, vowel consonant, reduplicated syllables, CBC, just different uh, length and phonetic complexity, these little subgroups. You'd say it, they'd say it. If it's not correct, you would cue it. So maybe first you just do a little um, gestural cue if they can't get good lip closure. Me. Or if, uh, for those that are listening, I know some of you are listening rather than <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. Gesture. <laughs> um, and if, um, if they still don't get it, then we might do a little tactile cue where we right. just use our lip, bring their lips together. Um, we want to work hard to increase proprioception. So we might say, feel that. Look what I'm doing. Do what I do. Don't let go when I take my hand away. Don't let go. Mm-hmm. So you're increasing the, the proprioceptive uh, ability of the child. They're getting the visual cues. Very important for them to watch you. We've learned that through our research that if they're watching our face, mm-hmm. they're going to do a lot better than if they're looking at a picture. So that's a treatment answer sorry but even in assessment we don't use any any pictures we okay so, oh that's interesting so i haven't given this assessment because i kind of work with a different population but i find yeah. this extremely fascinating so so with the dynamic so with this assessment are you trying different cues is it like a hierarchy where you're trying yes. a cue and then you're saying like was that better or i mean is that kind of how it is exactly we usually okay. do a hierarchy where we start with just the gestural cue uh then or they're always doing the visual cue And so we might slow it first with a gestural cue. Then if we have to, we'll add a tactile cue. If we can't get anywhere, then we might go all the way back to our old toolkit of speech pathology and do phonetic placement for a while. If they really can't get that tongue to the alveolar ridge for a T or if they're Mm -hmm. having trouble with lip closure. And then we go through the, the rest of the hierarchy of cueing. Now, in a Formal standard dynamic assessment like the DEMS, you have you you have this hierarchy of cues, but you only give them six tries, or you'd okay. never get through it. Right. Um, although we've we've got it to the point where even for a severe child, you can do it in about twenty minutes. Hmm. But um, and for a child that's more mild to moderate, you can do it in ten to fifteen. It's really not not that long. Um, it looks long when you look at it, but it's, it's quick. To yeah. Do. Um, yeah. Yeah, so it, it does involve this cueing, and then you score it based on their responses to that cueing. Okay. Oh, that's really fascinating. Yeah, really, really, yeah, I love that, that it's so specific. So then this obviously would give you then really good information about how to plan your scope and sequence of intervention as far as where you're going to start and how that would look. That's, yeah, absolutely, Rose. That's a- the perfect observation to make. That's just what it does. The benefits of dynamic assessment, uh, besides differential diagnosis, we did research to assess the validity and reliability. How well does this test reliably distinguish groups of kids that are a practic from the larger group of speech sound disorders? And we showed that it was valid and reliable. So good. That's the differential diagnosis part. But there's, there's more to... Uh, the benefits of dynamic assessment. One is you get to see what kind of cueing works well for the kids. You know, especially with the autism population, there are some kids that can do the task. Mm -hmm. They're social, they're responsive, they can watch, but they don't like to be touched. Mm -hmm. So tactile cueing isn't so good for them. So you wouldn't do that. 
Um, but other kids maybe respond better to different kind of cueing. So you learn that in the dynamic assessment. You get a much better idea of severity. For example, you can give two kids the Goldman Fristo, get a standard score of 40, and you know in your clinical heart, one child's going to fly and the other child's going to be in therapy for a while. <laughs> but you don't have anything to prove to that. You know, you don't have anything mm-hmm. other than to tell the parent about the severity other than I've seen a hundred kids or I've right. seen a thousand kids. Mm-hmm. I know that your child is going to struggle. On the other hand, in dynamic assessment, the score really does reflect severity mm-hmm. um, in a way that's very important as you're thinking about prognosis, early treatment targets, um, those mm-hmm. kinds of things are all really, the, the dynamic assessment is a huge benefit in those ways. Yeah, that's that's really fascinating. And you touched on autism a little bit, but I do get a lot of questions on social media just about a Praxia, and it's definitely not an area that I specialize in. And so it is interesting because some of the things, you know, I know that I've worked with students, um, like I've always worked in a public school. And then before my business got too uh, big, I always worked in these non, we call them non public programs, but they're, you know, applied behavior analysis type centers for students who typically have a lot of behavioral barriers. So sometimes, like we wouldn't, we would try to work on imitation even, but some of this that you're saying, it's so nuanced that I would imagine that maybe not everybody is a candidate for it just because of the prompting. Would that, would that be true? Do you think, or, cause you do have to have like a level of, of sitting and, you know, being, um, able to be cued and prompted and, and things right. like that. You bet. There are, um, I guess you would say, you know, basic requirements to be able to do the dynamic assessment uh, and or the kinds of treatment apraxic children benefit from the most. But we've been successful with two-year-olds and with very hyper kids um, by bringing in very quick reinforcers, a lot of novel things, hold my hands, look at me, Mm -hmm. you know, things that are just constantly changing things around. Now, that's not specific to the autism population. Mm -hmm. I, I think with the with the children on the spectrum, you know, it varies so much. The children that didn't have joint attention yet, because we saw a lot of children. We had a big developmental clinic that mm-hmm. um, we would evaluate children for, and um, we saw a lot of children with autism. And this isn't my specialty either, in that I don't do research in this area. But I've mm-hmm. seen a lot of children, and mm-hmm. and if they don't have joint attention yet. Um, beyond you know if they have any attention if they can imitate anything Mm -hmm. we start you know Mm -hmm. but if they don't yet have have joint attention um then they're not read there then we have to work at you know Mm -hmm. language and cognition and writing what you want Mm -hmm. that kind of stuff so so we you know those kids wouldn't be at all appropriate on the other hand we've had children who are diagnosed as autistic yeah. who are, you know, are not high functioning, but they're also able to watch. They're able to mm-hmm. imitate. Um, if you, you know, organize your therapy and choose your treatment targets within their language capabilities mm-hmm. and go slower and you have to, you know, make adjustments for any attentional problems or repetitive behaviors or uh, unusual things, um, you, you can do at least some motor speech training for sure. Mm-hmm. We did get some children at Mayo who were diagnosed as autistic and apractic who were echolalic. Mm. And that was kind of an interesting thing to me because in in my mind, they they couldn't do a motor speech exam. I mean, they could maybe because if I said something, Ned said something. Right. But they, there was no meaning involved. And they were mm-hmm. just doing whole scripts from cartoons or scripts from uh, commercials. Mm-hmm. Um, that would just go on, but there was no meaningful communication. Right. And yet they were beautifully articulating these long strings um, that they were, you know, that, with the, through the secolalia and came in with the diagnosis of apraxia. And that confused me a bit. Right. So that, that was kind of surprising to me. Thanks for listening to Autism Outreach. If you enjoyed the show today, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode full of actionable strategies you can use in your therapy room. Write a review too. That would mean so much to me. I always love hearing from you. 
Have a specific topic that you want included on a future show? Reach out over on Instagram, ABA Speech by Rose, or visit me at www.abaspeech.org.